Hi, welcome back to module 2-3, setting up the Arduino IDE, Arduino program structure. In this module, we'll be going through what an Arduino program looks like and how they operate. We'll very briefly go over C++ language constructs, but we'll refer you to links that go over that much better than we'll be able to do in this course. Let's get started. The basic structure of an Arduino program looks like this. You get a reset event, which could be a push of the reset button or a power on meaning you just turn the device on, which generates what's called a power on reset. After reset, the microcontroller jumps to a special function we call setup. This function is only run one time and we handle all of our initialization and configuration here before we jump into our main program. Some examples of configuration would be setting specific pins to output if we wanted them to control an LED or setting some pins to input if we wanted them to read the voltage on them and convert it to a number. This, by the way, is done using what's called an analog to digital converter, which we'll discuss in a later module. Or it could be to initialize a peripheral like the serial port and set the baud rate or speed at which we want it to run. We'll also be discussing this later too. But basically, within the setup function, we'll be handling all of this. Then we drop into another special Arduino function called the loop function. This function does exactly what it says it does. It loops infinitely. Yes, one dirty secret of device development or all of computing for that matter, is that it's all driven by a single infinite loop. On Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, you're so far removed from the low level that you mainly see the operating system with its multi-process, multitasking features. But in device development, or more technically, embedded development, which is the formal name of what we'll be doing, we operate at a level low enough where we're not very far removed from the one infinite loop that defines the main program. So when you see something like this, you can now giggle at the inside joke that the pioneers of computing all share. All of computing's functionality occurs in the one infinite loop. It's important enough to reiterate, a basic Arduino program or sketch, we'll refer to them interchangeably, minimally contains a setup and a loop function. The setup is where initialization and configuration take place. After it finishes the setup function, our application will drop into and spend the rest of its life in the loop function until the next reset, power cycle, or as we'll later learn, interrupt. All of the main functionality like sensors, switching things on and off, user interfaces, or even sleeping happens in the loop function. This is the actual code of the first Arduino program we'll be writing. It's just for show and we haven't reached that submodule yet, so it's a bit of a teaser. At this moment, you don't need to know what each function call means, i.e. pin mode or digital write. What's important to look at is the structure of the program. You have the setup function where things are being configured and set to a known state. Then you have a loop function that it will stay in infinitely. This specific code is for blinking an LED. But as you'll see, we can get it to do much more complex things. Now it's time to introduce ourselves to the wild logger board and take a brief tour. The first thing we can look at is the power switch. In normal operation, only a battery would be plugged in. If its position is towards the battery connector, it's on. If it's away from the battery connector, it's off. When you're developing on the board and have the USB plugged in, the off position becomes USB power as opposed to battery power. Next is the built-in LED. On most Arduino boards, this is digital pin 13. Most Arduino and Arduino compatible boards have this LED in common and is often considered a standard feature. Below that is the battery connector. This is where you would plug the battery a pack into. There's special circuitry on the board to keep the voltage constant on the system even as the batteries are draining. Next up is the PIR connector. Actually, you can plug in other 3-pin digital sensors here as well. But for this particular wild logger application, we'll be plugging in the PIR motion sensor here. It's associated with digital pin 3, or just pin 3. There is another feature for this pin that we can use, and it'll be very useful for the PIR motion sensor. And we'll discuss that later in the workshop. The next two connectors are sensor 0 and sensor 1. These both take in digital or analog single pin sensors, a single pin digital sensor is a sensor that has a power pin, ground pin, and only one pin for the data output. The DHT11 temperature and humidity sensor, the one we'll be using in this course, is a single pin sensor and there are various other sensors, like the Dallas Semiconductor one wire sensors, that are also single pin digital sensors. These pins, A0 or A1, have the A designation because they can also take in analog values. A single pin analog sensor has a power pin, ground pin, and a single pin with an analog output. An analog output simply means it can occupy any voltage between 3.3 volts and 0 volts, whereas a digital output means it can only output two voltages, 
3.3 volts or 0 volts. Analog sensors output voltages between 0 and 3.3 volts corresponding to the sensor reading. To convert these analog voltages to numerical values, we use the analog to digital converter. We'll get into this more when we discuss analog to digital conversion and how we can interface analog sensors. The next connector is for devices that use a serial protocol called I2C. Many sensors use this protocol as well as peripheral devices like LCD displays. The Arduino platform has a built-in library called Wire that handles I2C communications. If you don't use this port for I2C communications, you can use the two I.O. pins as digital pins 20 and 21. This is useful for some sensors that require two digital I.O. pins, such as ultrasonic range finders. Although we won't go deeply into the I2C protocol in this course, we will likely talk about it in some bonus material or later courses. The reset button is used to reset the system. This comes in handy if the software crashes or it starts acting really weird. Then you just push the reset. The dip switch controls whether the power LED indicators for the 3.3 and 5 volt supplies are active. Those LEDs tell you if the main power supplies are working, but they also consume power. That means that they're not good if you're planning to operate on batteries and want the system to last for weeks or months. So in that case, you'd want to turn off those switches, which turns off those LEDs. Next up is the USB serial cable. This connector is used to connect up the USB dongle, which then communicates with the PC. There are also two auxiliary buttons, button 0 and button 1, which correspond to digital pins 6 and 7. These buttons can be used to trigger specific actions, or if you connect up an LCD display, you can use it to create your own user interface and menu. Fun, fun, fun! And finally, there are two additional auxiliary LEDs along with the built-in LED. These LEDs are digital pins 4 and 27 and can be used during development or operation to indicate the internal state of the system. We'll see later how LEDs can be important for development purposes as well as visual indicators. Now that we've taken a brief tour of WildLogger, we're now ready to jump into some code. Arduino programming acquired a reputation as programming in some simplified language. The creators of Arduino tried to promote this at one point, calling the language wiring. It was actually a bunch of built-in functions supported by Arduino. However, Arduino is programmed in C++, and you'll be programming in C++. Arduino was originally created to teach designers how to program devices, and the original creators were trying to prevent scaring them away by using the term C++. In any case, we won't hide from that fact, but it's not scary at all. In fact, all of the complexity of traditional programming in C++ is abstracted by the IDE, so you don't see the messy details that you traditionally had to deal with. What Arduino does really well is give a lot of useful built-in functions, which allows you to get more things done without using the more sophisticated parts of C++ syntax. This makes the code more straightforward and allows programmers and designers to focus on functionality rather than semantics. C++ can get really complicated and very messy, but we're going to stick with the very basic language constructs without diving into the more academic ones. As mentioned, we'll only be using a subset of the C++ language, which will actually get us quite far. For this course, the main things we'll expect you to know or have a basic understanding of are data types for variables, both signed and unsigned. Signed variables mean they can contain negative as well as positive numbers. Loops are extremely important, and we'll use two types, for loops and while loops. We'll also be using comparison operators. The main ones are equality, inequality, less than, and greater than. And of course, conditionals. These are if else statements. Although you won't need to explicitly understand classes, we will be instantiating class objects. These are similar to declaring a variable, but sometimes also take arguments. And finally, we'll be using the following macros quite a bit. Pound include and pound define. Pound include includes the library into the code so that we can access the library's functions. Pound define defines a constant which we'll use to make the code more readable. For more resources on programming, we highly recommend checking out these tutorials. Olympic Circuits has a great basic tutorial on the main points of C++ you'll need to understand to become productive on an Arduino. Tutorials Point goes into much more detail, but provides a good reference as a site you can go back to as situations come up. The Arduino website has a great language reference that details all the built-in functions, many of which we won't even get to, but you may find you need later on. In this submodule, we learned about basic Arduino program structure, the setup and loop functions, 
a tour of the Wildlogger board, and the basic language constructs we expect you to be familiar with. In the next submodule, we'll get started writing our first programs. Stay tuned for module 2-4, smashing keys on our keyboard. <laughs> Just kidding, writing our first programs.